Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, week four and welcome to this uh, video on mediation. It's now week four, so uh, we've really progressed along the term. And uh, in this lecture video, we're going to be covering one of the topics uh, which is which involves one of the more, in a sense, more formal uh, processes of mediation, which involves a third party. Now, let, let me begin by uh, emphasizing that, as I mentioned in the past uh, videos, there's a lot of conflict that happens in life, apart from the questions about death and taxes being uh, a permanent features of life. There's also the permanent feature of conflict, and therefore, if there's conflict, oftentimes we do engage in negotiations. But we realize that oftentimes negotiations fail simply because the parties uh, can't sort things out just by themselves. And typically they would need an intervention of a third party, third party person, uh, some kind of a referee. And uh, that's uh, the topic of uh, this lecture video. We're gonna be talking about mediation, but before I go there, I wanna share a, uh, an interview I had with a client just about two nights ago. And this involved a family matter. And of course, in the course of uh, doing the client interview, the client, in, the client insisted that there were interim orders issued by the court over, uh, over their eight-year-old child, eight-year-old daughter. And then there was even a consent order. And yet, in the course of the interview that I conducted, the client said that he needed legal advice because there was gonna be a hearing conducted by the court around November, which made me wonder if there was a consent order, why, in, a, in other words, if there's a consent order, typically what happens is that the case has been resolved and it has already been terminated. And therefore there is no reason for any hearing because uh, all the, everything pertaining to the legal matter would have been resolved in the form of the consent order. So it was unusual that uh, there was a hearing that was scheduled in November. And it, it took a while to figure out that it would appear that uh, the client kind of misunderstood what had happened. There were ongoing negotiations with his lawyers and the lawyers of the other party. And although there were draft consent orders, they were never signed by the parties and they were, they were never submitted to the court uh, for approval. So in fact, there was no court order in place. But the crucial point of this was that one of, one of the key questions early on uh, that I mentioned was that this related to the fact that the client insisted that he was actually in good terms with the mother of his daughter. I'm using the word mother because they were not really, uh, they, were, they were never married. I don't think they even lived in, uh, lived together. And he insisted, you know, it was, it was kind of, kind of a, uh, an isolated sexual event, uh, which led to them having a daughter. And, but he insisted that they had a, he had a very good, really good, you know, relationship with the, with the uh, mother of the child in the sense that they would talk. And so I asked him, if that is the case, why don't you have a consent order in place? And that's when he said that, you know, there is, a, there is in fact a consent order. When I find, find out there actually wasn't any. And when we looked through the files, there was really no record of, of a consent order issued by the judge of the Federal Circuit Court. But the one thing that I wanted to emphasize was that it would appear that the, the parties, both parties had the view that if they couldn't resolve the matter between themselves, it had to be resolved by the court. And that actually to me is a mistaken view because even if there were a consent order, in other words, even if the court made a determination in relation to the legal matter, that wasn't gonna be the end of their conflict because the conflict was gonna, would, would continue. They would have to continue to parent, co-parent their eight-year-old daughter for the next 10 years. And in that case, therefore, the likelihood is very high that there would be conflicts and disagreements and friction in relation to a lot of parenting matters pertaining, for example, to school holidays or when there is a desire, uh, when there are questions about relocation because of you know, changing family circumstances, employment opportunities and so on. If there are questions about whether a child should go swimming or there will be additional expenses for school and so on. So there's always room for friction in these types of legal matters. And so at the end of the day, uh, well, not really at the end of the day, but you know, during the interview, I emphasized to him the need to realize that at some point, 
the parties have got to be able to empower themselves to try to resolve their own disputes, even, and I acknowledge it's not easy, but the point is to think that the solution to any conflict always lies with the court is actually a very wrong and a mistaken view. And this is something that you as law students and eventually as lawyers have to consider because uh, courts will, will never be in a position to always, find, to always provide the proper resolution to all legal disputes. And not only that, uh, it's always, it, it's often in a sense risky to leave it to the court to make a determination about the legal matter because it may be an outcome that the parties are not happy with or cannot live with. But being able to come up with an, agree an agreement between themselves uh, is likely going to permit the parties to be able to say that they did their best in arriving at a uh, resolution to a legal dispute. And uh, I mentioned to him that you, know, you may have to consider using principle-based negotiation. And for one, uh, it's really about uh, making sure that you go beyond you know, uh, personalizing the issue, uh, looking, focusing on uh, questions about personal matters, but really just focusing on the issues and what might be for the best interest of the child. Now, in any event, uh, I think this is a good, a good opportunity there, therefore for us that at some point or sometimes, even if the parties may attempt to negotiate a settlement of a, of a legal dispute, uh, they simply are unable to do it just between themselves. They need a third person, they need a mediator. And so, to, uh, and so in this lecture video, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about mediation. I will also discuss conciliation and arbitration towards the end of the lecture video, just to, for, you, for you to get a view of how mediation and conciliation and arbitration are different from each other. But the focus of the lecture video is gonna be on mediation. And... So in terms of learning outcomes, on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the process of mediation, some key terms involved in the process of mediation, the hallmarks of a mediation process, instances when it may not be appropriate to mediate, the role of the mediator, and uh, be able to distinguish mediation from conciliation and arbitration. Now, the, the first question we should be asking is, you know, why should we even consider entering into mediation? Why should lawyers consider entering into mediation? Or why should parties even enter, consider entering into mediation when uh, they could potentially try to resolve the disagreement or legal dispute between themselves? And as we mentioned last time, uh, we talked about the parties entering into negotiations just between themselves without the need of a third party getting involved. Okay, now, but as we said, Sometimes uh, negotiations fail. The parties uh, can't resolve it uh, between themselves. And so they need somebody to intervene. And we do notice this uh, happening sometimes. Like, you know, there are two parties who can't talk to each other. They're in a dispute. You need somebody to come in, step into the picture and uh, to try to intervene to help the parties resolve the dispute. And that's the nature of mediation. But more importantly, if negotiations fail, one of the crucial steps really is to try to uh, take steps to genuinely resolve a dispute because uh, it is very costly for a party, you know, for, for a party to go through trial and uh, make the judge, put the judge in a position where he actually adjudicates and makes a determination on the legal matter because the basic rule, uh, both under the common law and uh, in, under the statutory frameworks now is that uh, costs follow the event or costs follow the, follow the victor. So in other words, it typically happens that costs will be assessed against a losing party if it comes to the point that the judge has to make a determination or adjudication uh, about a legal matter. So that's one. By entering into, uh, into mediation, the party is able to demonstrate that he or she has taken uh, genuine steps to solve the dispute. And that is crucial later on if it comes to the point where the court has to make a determination and assess costs, the court will take into account whether or not the parties have demonstrated genuine steps to resolve a dispute. But the second point is, uh, it is often the case that mediation is now court ordered, and we're gonna be examining that uh, in a short while. And, and, and as important, mediation can in fact be effective, and it is inexpensive. 
at least in contrast to having to engage with lawyers and going through trial where uh, there's cost in terms of the amount of money involved in, in hiring lawyers, perhaps uh, getting uh, experts to get involved. And of course, uh, cost in terms of the time uh, in having to uh, always uh, be at trial and perhaps miss work and so on. So there are, you know, at, at least the reasons. Um, mediation can often be very effective, assuming that you've got an, a good mediator and it's uh, a legal matter that, that is suitable for uh, mediation. We're going to be looking as well as uh, uh, those uh, times when mediation would be suitable and when it may not be. I'll be discussing that in this uh, lecture video as well. Now, let's talk about costs. And you know, this is something you need to bear in mind. This is something that you need to be able to advise your client that if they do go, you know, through trial and make and and, and um, allow the judge or you know go to that point where the judge has to adjudicate on the legal matter there is a a there is a statutory uh, authority on the part uh, authority for the judge to uh, award costs so for example in under the civil proceedings act 2011 queensland under section 15 it provides that a court may award costs in all proceedings unless otherwise provided. So although it is in the common law, it is now uh, in statute that courts have the authority to award costs in all legal proceedings. Under the uh, Uniform Civil Procedure Rules 1999 Queensland, particularly section 8680, uh, costs of a proceeding, including an application in a proceeding are in the discretion of the court, but follow the event unless the court orders otherwise. It's very clear again under this, under the statutory provision that costs follow the event. So in other words, costs are typically awarded uh, to the winning party in a, in a civil proceeding. Again, making us, uh, you know, just reminding us that in a court proceeding, which is typical, which is always adversarial, what the framework we have is a win-lose situation. There's somebody who wins, there is somebody who loses, but when you engage in negotiation or when you engage in mediation, for example, your goal, if, especially if you follow integrative negotiations or um, if you follow principle-based negotiation, the goal of the parties would be to arrive at an outcome that is win-win for all the parties involved. Now, under the uh, under the Civil Dispute Resolution Act 2011, and this now goes to the point where more than the question of the, the parties uh, trying to resolve their dispute in order to ensure that you know, they, they, they don't have to wait for a court or a judge to adjudicate and therefore award costs to, to, the, to the winner or to the winning party in a litigation, uh, mediation, will also take place as a result uh, of the requirements either of the court or of statute. For example, under the Civil Dispute Resolution Act 2011, Commonwealth, so this is a, a Commonwealth statute, it provides that the object of this, of this act to ensure that as far as possible, people take genuine steps to resolve disputes before certain civil proceedings are instituted. So it is now a requirement, for example, under the Civil Dispute Resolution Act 2011, that before certain civil proceedings are instituted, people must take genuine steps to resolve disputes. And we see this happening uh, in relation to parenting matters, parenting matters under the Family Law Act. We're gonna see that in a short while. Under uh, section four of that statute, for the purposes of this act, a person takes genuine steps to resolve a dispute. If the steps taken by the person in relation to the dispute constitute a sincere, and genuine attempt to resolve the dispute, having regard to the personal circumstances and the nature and circumstances of the dispute. Now, of course, um, under this particular provision, it doesn't mean it has to be mediation because negotiation, uh, it can be a, a way, uh, can be a sincere and genuine attempt to resolve the dispute. But as we will see, for example, under the Family Law Act, it is a requirement that uh, it, prior to the filing of a, uh, an application uh, for a parenting order, the parties will have to go to a family dispute resolution practitioner who uses mediation 
uh, and it's insufficient for the parties to just try to negotiate with each other. Unless, of course, as I mentioned later on, uh, there are uh, factors which prevent the parties from entering into mediation, uh, for example, such as when there's family violence or uh, domestic violence and abuse and so on. Now, under the Civil Dispute Resolution Act 2011 Commonwealth, uh, there is a requirement that under Section 6 that an applicant who institutes civil proceedings in an eligible court must file a genuine steps statement at the time of filing the application. So it's now, so at least, you know, at the level of the Commonwealth, it is a statutory requirement, but there has to be proof and evidence that uh, the, the applicant who institutes civil proceedings has really uh, taken genuine steps to resolve the disputes by filing, by being required by statute to file a genuine step statement at the time of filing the application. Now, in relation to the Family Law Act pertaining, for example, to, uh, par to, to seeking an application for a parenting order over a minor child, there is a requirement that is section 60I, 60I that all persons who have a dispute about matters that may be dealt with by an order under this part, for example, a parenting order, must make a genuine effort to resolve the dispute by family dispute resolution before the part seven order is applied for. Now, we need to know that when we speak of the family dispute resolution, this typically involves the use of mediation. Using, however, through the, through the uh, facilitation or the help, of a family dispute practitioner, but you know, uh, under under the law, under Family Law Act, under the Family Law Act of 1975, when there is an effort to resolve a dispute by family dispute resolution, the mechanism or process involved is actually mediation. Now, more importantly, um, it is, it could be the case that an applicant has filed uh, an application. It has been accepted by the court, but even then the court may still uh, order the parties to undertake mediation. So for example, under the Civil Proceeding Act 2011, Queensland section 43, a court may require the parties or their representatives to attend before it, uh, to enable it to decide whether the parties dispute should be referred to an ADR process. Uh, this section also applies if a party applies to the court for an order referring a dispute to an ADR process or the parties are uh, otherwise before the court and the court may by order, uh, referring order refer the dispute to mediation or case appraisal. We're gonna be examining case appraisal later on. Now, uh, in under section 44 of the Civil Proceeding Act 2011 in Queensland, if a referring order is made, the parties must attend before the ADR convener appointed to conduct the ADR process and must not impede the ADR convener in conducting and uh, finishing the ADR process within the time allowed under the referring order. We also need to know that even if the case has now been set for trial, even if the, even if the court has already started to hear evidence uh, in relation to a matter before it, it is still possible that well, it is still likely that the judge will encourage the parties to try to negotiate uh, the, the, the dispute or to even uh, try to resolve the dispute by mediation, even, you know, even late in the game. Uh, and that just uh, reminds us that according to statistics, actually about 90 to 95% of uh, cases are resolved without the court having to adjudicate on the legal matter mainly because the court uh, provides ample opportunities for the disputants uh, to try to resolve the dispute through ADR. Uh, under the Uniform Civil Procedure Rules 1999 Queensland under section 319, the court may direct the registrar to give written notice to the parties that the parties dispute is to be referred by order to an ADR process to be conducted by a specified mediator or case appraiser. Now you will notice again that a lot of the references so far is mediation. That's because we're talking of uh, about mediation in this lecture video, but uh, there will be uh, a lot of instances where the court will uh, order the parties to undertake uh, arbitration. Uh, we're gonna be, we'll, we'll have a chance to touch a brief on that issue uh, towards the end of this lecture video. Now, so we, we've, we've covered the, uh, we've discussed 
the reasons why the parties may undertake mediation, not only because one, uh, it, it is likely to be court ordered, two, it is actually a statutory requirement that prior to filing an application, the parties must undertake mediation. Three, uh, parties must undertake mediation because uh, they want to avoid the possibility of the court adjudicating on the matter and potentially awarding costs, therefore, to, to, the, uh, to the winning party. And fourth, because mediation is often effective. Again, if you know, it's suitable for mediation, you have a good mediator, as I will indicate later on, there are a lot of mediators who shouldn't be mediating because they don't know what they're doing. And I'm gonna be com commenting on that as well. Now, so let's not talk about mediation. What exactly is mediation, okay? Now, the crucial point is that, as I mentioned, oftentimes the parties try to negotiate uh, between themselves to resolve a dispute and they become unsuc unsuccessful. It would appear that they need somebody to step in they need somebody to intervene, somebody who is impartial. They need a referee to try to, you know, help them. Uh, well, in negotiation, actually, uh, you know, you could have an intervener in the sense that if it's a couple uh, trying to consider uh, separation or divorce, they may ask, for example, a religious leader to get involved. Or it could be a friend. But the point there is, you know, the understanding that sometimes when there are disputes or there are conflicts, you do need a third party to get involved. Okay. Now. Mediation is a bit more a, a more formal process in the sense that uh, it's uh, it's it's often you know that there is a process that's often followed and uh, there could be guidelines that need to be adhered to by mediators uh, in conducting mediation. So what exactly again is mediation? It involves an impartial and neutral third party who has no authoritative decision making power to assist disputing parties in voluntarily reaching their own mutually acceptable settlement of dispute, of issues in dispute. So the key point there is that in mediation, you have a third party who gets involved. That third party has to be impartial. He doesn't take sides, he is neutral. But more importantly, we need to realize that the mediator has no authority to make decisions. Decisions are actually uh, to be made by the parties themselves. The role of the mediator is to facilitate that discussion of the disputants in order for them to reach an agreement. Now, a good mediator has skills that he or she uses in order to, you know, to facilitate that discussion between the parties, even if the parties uh, may have an acrimonious relationship. A good mediator is able to break down, uh, you know, that that try try to ease and uh, the conflict between the parties. So that instead of focusing on themselves, focusing their emotions and focusing their anger, they can focus on the issues and probably focus on the interests behind or underlying uh, certain legal positions or positions taken by the party. So the goal or the role of the mediator is mainly to facilitate a discussion, facilitate the parties arriving at an agreement. The mediator does not take a determinative role in the sense that you know the, the the mediator tells the parties what to do, the part the mediator does not really um, uh, does does not provide any guidance on what the law might be or the respective guidance. Of the part uh, does not provide guidance on uh, what the legal positions of the parties might be. That is, which is something that the conciliator would do. But the goal of the mediator is some is is really just to facilitate that discussion. So that at the end of the day, it's going to be the parties arriving at a decision or a resolution of the dispute by themselves. Now, so what are the elements of mediation? Uh, the disputing in, in mediation, the disputing parties are assisted by a third party who is a mediator. The goal of the mediator is to assist the parties in identifying the issues, developing options. Uh, the goal of the mediator is to try to get the parties to reach an agreement. And crucially, the mediator does not advise on the content of the dispute or on the law. The, me the mediator does not make a determination. The mediator does not make a decision or judgment for the parties. The me mediator may, however, advise only on the process. The mediator may say, this is the way we're going to be conducting the mediation. We're going to have a look at that in a short while. Now, as I mentioned, mediation may or not, may or not, may or may not be voluntary. So it's uh, typically uh, 
voluntary in the sense that when I was uh, dealing with a client uh, on Wednesday night, I mentioned to him that, you know, there's nothing that would stop you from engaging the services of a good mediator. Okay. And uh, again, uh, the reason for that is that sometimes uh, the, the approach of lawyers is, of course, always often based on legal, what the law is or what the legal position or legal interests of, the, of his or her client might be. And uh, that may not necessarily uh, be favorable uh, in, in trying to get the parties to arrive at a settlement. Rather, if you allow a mediator to step in, the mediator is able to open uh, possibilities open the eyes to the parties that they need to consider interests underlying legal positions and to go beyond the legal framework or what the law provides in order for them to arrive at an agreement that they could be happy with or live with. So in mediation, uh, mediation is a process where the participants with the assistance of an independent person as mediator uh, listen to and are heard by each other they work out what the disputed issues are, they work out what everyone agrees on, work out what is important to each person, they aim to reach a workable agreement, they develop options to resolve each issue, develop options that they take into account each person's needs and desires and discuss what everyone could do as a way of assessing the options and exploring why, what might lead to an outcome that everyone can live with. And so in terms of the process, it's voluntary, uh, as a process, it involves an attempt at decision-making by the parties, not by the mediator. And you will notice, again, if it's going to be adjudication by the judge, it will be the judge making the decision for the parties. But in mediation, it is the parties trying to uh, make a decision by and for themselves. Uh, as a process, it is a, the, the process towards arriving at an agreement, or at least even a discussion of the dispute, is facilitated by a third party. It is assisted, there's an assistance by a third party. And as I mentioned, as a process, it may be imposed by the court. And it typically is outside the adjudicative space of court or tribunal, uh, in the sense that it can, uh, the parties, without there being a live legal proceeding, be, before even there, even if there is no actual uh, legal proceeding uh, before a court, they can seek uh, to try to uh, engage the services of a mediator to assist them in arriving at a uh, at the settlement or solution to a dispute. Now, the, in terms of the mediator, the mediator has to be impartial and neutral. The mediator has to be independent. Now, it's really, it's really sad that sometimes, and I've had my own very unpleasant experience, the mediator can appear to be taking sides. And this is really a terrible outcome because the moment that one of the parties gets a sense that the mediator is taking sides or has formed a view of you know, what the resolution should be, it is very difficult. Uh, it, it, it is very likely that um, the mediation becomes successful or that the parties will arrive at a settlement. This is really an important point because if the mediator fails, because the mediator does a very poor job and there are a lot of incompetent mediators out there, it's really sad because then the parties get the sense that mediation is not a good option and therefore they have to go to court. And but that is something that you know, the parties ought to try to avoid because, again, by going to court, you leave yourselves to the mercy or you know to, to that point where it is a, a third party neutral judge who makes a decision, but the decision may not be something that you could be happy with, especially if the decision is, will be fashioned as a, as a, as a win-lose outcome. Somebody wins, but somebody loses. So uh, mediators have a huge responsibility, but you know there are just so many mediators out there. You don't know who are competent and who are, who are incompetent. Now, the, the mediator uh, attempts to improve the decision-making process. Again, he, is a, he or she is a third-party neutral, and the role of the mediator is facilitative, not determinative. Facil facilitative in the sense that he, facilit he or she facilitates the discussion of the parties, facilitates 
an attempt towards a settlement of the dispute. It is not determinative in the sense that the mediator determines the outcome of, uh, of the dispute. Now, in terms of the parties, uh, the focus should be, in terms of the definitions, the focus should really be on the parties. The focus is not on the mediator, okay? So the mediator might be there, but really the, sorry, the starring role, you know, the main characters in mediation are actually the parties. Of course, in a legal proceeding before a judge, the judge is the star, you have to convince the judge. But in mediation, the key players there are actually the parties. And uh, the parties have a central role and ability to exercise control over aspects of the process, as well as the content. Now, when is mediation suitable? Mediation would be suitable when you think a mediator can set up a respectful discussion on the issues. You feel safe in the presence of each other. You want the third part person to assist the discussion. You want to control the outcome rather than ask someone, someone else to decide the outcome, such as an arbitrator or such as a judge. You want to make the decision yourselves. You want to maintain an ongoing relationship with the other party. Uh, because oftentimes, again, if, if a decision is handed down by a judge and it has a win-lose outcome, it can really damage the relationship. And uh, that can be unfortunate, especially when the parties need to continue to have a relationship, even if there is an order uh, or a judgment issued by a judge, uh, especially in a parenting matter, for example. Now, uh, mediation is also suitable when you want to keep discussions confidential. Now, uh, as we will learn later on, negotiations uh, are typically uh, covered by the rules on confidentiality under the common law. Uh, and especially in the case of mediation, what is discussed in the course of the mediation, what offers are made in order to resolve the dispute are confidential and uh, cannot be used as evidence in court. We're gonna be exploring that particular topic I think around week eight or week nine of uh, the term. Uh, so mediation is also suitable when you want to find in innovative ways to resolve the dispute, such as an outcome where everybody benefits, sometimes called a win-win outcome, which we talked about uh, in the context of uh, integrative negotiation as well as principle-based negotiation last week. Now, mediation, however, is not always suitable. Now, if someone's safety is at risk, for example, where there's domestic violence or child abuse is involved, in that case, uh, typically mediation would not be suitable. Uh, because, I mean, there, one, there's a question about the, the power imbalance in the sense that, you know, one party obviously has more power over the other and the other, the other party probably feels a sense of dread, fear, even at, uh, having to face the other party. And in that case, you know, if, if one party uh, has fear uh, in, in a proceeding such as a mediation, then uh, it's very unlikely that the parties can openly discuss since, uh, you know, genuinely openly and sincerely discuss what their legal positions might be, what their interests might be, and, you know, uh, and therefore arrive at an outcome that they could be very happy with. Because again, there is, a, a lack of openness. There's a lack of, uh, you know, the, the sense that you are safe in, in having these discussions. So even the Family Law Act allows uh, for uh, a party to file an application for a parenting order under the Family Law Act straight away, even without having to uh, see a family dispute resolution practitioner when there is evidence of violence or abuse. And in which case the mediator can uh, issue an exemption certificate, or a party can uh, can file a, an, an affidavit to indicate the allegation the, the, to to establish the allegations of domestic violence or uh, child abuse. Now, mediation would also not be suitable, as I mentioned, uh, if there is the fear of the other party or fear of uh, retribution by a party. Uh, can can you imagine a situation, for example, where uh, and there have been instances, of course, where one of the parties, usually a woman, would actually uh, flee the, uh, the home shared by the parties and would often, uh, you know, live in a women's shelter, for example, 
in many cases, uh, you would have uh, women who are victims of domestic violence or even try to change their names uh, or disguise their identities. And can you imagine if they have got to go through the process of mediation? Uh, mediation can also be dangerous, <clears throat> especially if it's a face-to-face -face mediation in the sense that the, the party, the, the, other, the other party, if he is involved in domestic violence or is a perpetrator of domestic violence, can then potentially follow and stalk that other party after a proceeding. And, uh, but even then, even if, as we know, you know, there are options for shuttle mediation where the parties don't have to go to be face-to-face, -face, the mediator shuffles from, you know, or shuttles from one room to another, or even if it were online, again, it would not be suitable really if the one of the parties uh, feels unsafe in having to engage with the other party. Now, mediation also wouldn't be suitable when you don't know where the, where the other party is and cannot contact them. I mean, how can you have mediation when the other party is not there? Because mediation requires both parties being there. In a legal proceeding, it's very possible for one of the parties not to be there. And in which case, judgment could, could uh, be handed down by a judge against the other party who could be in default by non-appearance. But in mediation, because it is a, the attempt at settlement is something that is uh, discussed and uh, sought to be arrived at by both parties. Both parties have got to be there. Without the other, you can't have mediation. Now, sometimes the case is urgent, for example, location and recovery of, uh, which involves children orders. Uh, it might be better really in certain cases to just uh, go straight away to the court and ask for an interim order uh, rather than uh, having to wait for mediation because the, the problem the problem with mediation as we see is that because it get it, it seeks it the, the mediator attempts to facilitate the parties arriving at an agreement, if one of the parties is not interested in arriving at an outcome or at a settlement, then you know nothing will happen. It is a waste of time. It could be a waste of money, especially if you're uh, paying for mediators. In other words, even when you undergo mediation, there is a very good likelihood that no out, no you know, no resolution of the case will happen. So imagine a situation where you're desperately seeking to recover your child or you want to see the child because the other party is withholding uh, you know the withholding uh, the child from another parent if you if you undergo mediation you could and the other party simply you know refuses to hand over the child then it's useless it's pointless you would be better off just going to the court and asking for an interim order to compel the party in the best interest of the children or of the child to allow uh, you know, uh, both parents to have a meaningful relationship with a child. Uh, mediation uh, may also not be suitable when the mediator thinks that uh, it, it is not suitable for you. Uh, this could involve, for example, instances where uh, a crime might be involved or there might be a court order involved, which would prevent that. Mediation also is also not suitable when there is a court order which prevents you from having any contact with the other person uh, with, a, with a no exception clause. Now, even though a magistrate who issues, for example, a domestic violence order, an interim domestic violence order against a party, uh, will in that order indicate that a party, that uh, a respondent, for example, not approach uh, an applicant or the protected person within you know, a, a distance of about 50 meters or even 100 meters, typically in, a, in an interim or a permanent domestic violence order, the magistrate will indicate that uh, it would be permissible for there to be contact uh, between the parties in a legal proceeding, such as you know, before a judge or even before a mediator when that can be suitable. But there will be instances where uh, a court, uh, based on the circumstances, will make an absolute um, order or provision in the order that uh, one of the parties have no contact whatsoever in a even in a mediation proceeding with the other party. In that case, mediation would not be suitable. Mediation also would not be suitable where a party might have limited capacity to make decisions for themselves. So you can have uh, somebody with concerns about intellectual capacity or uh, perhaps uh, has at that point uh, mental health issues that 
would prevent that party from uh, making you know intelligent, mature uh, uh, decisions, uh, especially in in trying to forge a settlement. And so, therefore, that person may not have the full mental capacity to you know be able to make a a fully uh, a decision a a a settlement uh, that is uh, based on an informed consent. Uh, mediation also would not be would not be suitable when one or more parties in, is unwilling to resolve the dispute or unwilling to negotiate. Remember, mediation only works if both parties or all the parties, uh, you know, really we really wish to have the dispute resolved. But if you have a recalcitrant, if you have a recalcitrant uh, party who is uninterested in uh, resolving the dispute, then it's simply not going to work. Mediation also would not be suitable when the parties cannot agree on a date, time, location, and or attendees for the mediation, and uh, or when the party's attitude uh, towards each other uh, is just so acrimonious and heated that they, they, it simply is uh, not possible for the parties to reach an agreement in any event. Now, let's, let's examine in greater detail what mediators do not do, and oftentimes, you will notice if you were to undergo mediation, either as uh, one of the parties or as a lawyer for one of the parties, uh, it, it can often happen that you see mediators, uh, you know, not doing their jobs well. And I've actually had this experience and I've had to file a complaint, but it's terrible out there. There are just a lot of mediators who don't know what they're doing and who shouldn't be mediating. But what mediators should not be doing, they shouldn't take sides because their goal is to help uh, each participant uh, in uh, you know, dealing with each other in order to arrive at a uh, decision or a settlement or negotiated outcome. Mediators do not make decisions. It is you and the other participants who make the decision. The mediator uh, cannot tell you what to agree to. It is the parties who decide what to do, including whether to stay at mediation. The mediator has no power to order uh, anyone to do anything. The mediator cannot decide who is right or wrong. Everyone is different. The focus of mediation is on finding an outcome that everyone can live with. So the mediator is never in a position to say what is right, what is wrong, what the law might be. The mediator does not do that or cannot do that or shouldn't be doing do that. Shouldn't be doing that. The mediator cannot give legal, financial, or other expert advice. Um, if you choose, your lawyer can give you legal advice and your financial advisor can give you financial advice before, during, and after mediation. The mediator cannot and does not provide counseling. If a party really needs a counsel, uh, you know, really needs counseling, then uh, a one the, the party can uh, approach a psychologist or psychiatrist or counselor to give support before, during, and after mediation. Now, let's assume that uh, there is the parties now are about to uh, have mediation. Prior to the actual mediation, when both parties meet, of course, there's usually an intake interview, and uh, you know, so that the mediator or the mediation center is able to assess whether the conflict or the dispute is one that is suitable for mediation. Uh, they're also able to determine whether or not there might be safety concerns that they need to address prior or they need to consider prior to both parties being there in a mediation process. This will also allow them to determine whether or not it should be a face-to-face mediation, which is oftentimes more, more effective when you actually see the, you know, the other person, you can see the gestures, you can see the body language and emotions and so on, rather than online. And you know, the, the mediator will determine uh, the best mode of uh, mediation that could be used. Now, if, if that is done, the, in, the intake interview is done, and there's now an actual mediation, what then actually happens with the both parties being there is that the mediator will, you know, will welcome everyone, give introductions, you know, do a chit chat, uh, will provide a reminder of administrative issues, explaining what the mediation is about, how long it may take, if, there's my, if there might be a need for anyone to take a break. There'll be discussions about the fact that um, mediation proceedings are covered by the rules of confidentiality and, and so on. Uh, the, me the mediator may clarify her or his qualifications and training. The, uh, the mediator will also identify the roles of both present, that they have signed the mediation agreement, and that they agree to the confidentiality of the process. So what typically happens is that 
prior to the actual mediation, the parties have to agree uh, in using the mediation agreement as to certain terms, like, you know, they have to be respectful. Uh, it's the, the mediation process is confidential and so on. During the mediation itself, uh, the mediator will clarify that those in attendance have the requisite authority to settle and or what arrangements are in place to contact those with the authority if required. So this is an, uh, a crucial point where uh, one of the parties might be a company, for example, because it's a contract dispute or commercial dispute. And uh, you, what you have then is a representative of a company. The mediator has to clarify that the people in attendance have the requisite authority to settle. Otherwise, there's no point in having the mediation if the parties don't have the legal authority to settle. And then the mediator uh, will outline the procedural steps in the mediation process. The parties are permitted to make an opening statement. It's a very formal one, but you know, uh, say their piece in, in whatever in however whatever manner they, they wish. Uh, the the in the mediation, uh, the mediator again uh, try to get the parties to identify issues and interests, seek common ground. There might be a need for separate meetings with parties, shuttle negotiations between parties were appropriate. And then there'll be a final joint meeting, uh, and an attempt at getting a settlement in writing if it were possible, and then the practical implications of having an agreement in place. Now, again, one of the main goals of the mediator, uh, of course, is facilitating the discussion, but more than that, is more than just facilitating the discussion, the goal of the mediator is to facilitate a discussion towards a settlement of the dispute, okay? So uh, in that case, it's crucial that the mediator is able to pin down, uh, assist the parties in pinning down what the issues involved are, what exactly is the issue, what's the, what's the source of the conflict, what's the cause of the dispute. So it's identifying the legal issue and then move from that issue from that legal issue, the parties often take positions. This is my view. This is what I demand. This is what I need. This is what I want. But as I mentioned, if you examine principle-based negotiations, for example, we know that underlying those positions are interests. So for example, the desire, the, the position taken by a father that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a parent, in a care in a parenting uh, agreement or in a care arrangement, he or she should have, uh, you know, in a week, for example, uh, maybe in a fortnight, seven days with the child, uh, is with the child is with the father, seven days with the mother, and so on. That can be a legal position. And But there is an underlying interest behind it. What, what exactly is the interest? The interest might be that the father really wants to make sure that he or she, uh, that he has uh, uh, a meaningful time and a meaningful relationship with the child. And, but then again, you know, when you consider it further, there'll be questions like, uh, you know, what, what about questions of uh, distance? If the child is to keep on shuffling from one house to another and the, 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 party, the parents uh, live, you know, I don't know, an hour away from each other, how would that work in terms of the school of the child? Or uh, if, there, if, if there are concerns about the child being so young, having to move things and so on. And so, the, the point there is that just instead of just talking about legal positions, the mediator gets the parties to examine, you know, the other interests that can, can have an impact in relation to a legal position. Because a legal position is just a position, but there are many elements that uh, surround and uh, are part of that legal position about care arrangements and so on, for example. So. Uh, as part of the uh, role of the mediator, the mediator attempts to identify common ground. Uh, he or she desires to end the dispute. The mediator, uh, again, always tries to remind the parties that they may want to keep the dispute out of court. They want to minimize time, costs, and stress. They probably want to maintain some sort of relationship into the future, and they may want to bury the hatchet. So these are common grounds for both parties. And that's probably the reason why the parties are willing to meet in the first place. So the, the, these common grounds have got to be reiterated by uh, the, the mediator in order to try to encourage the parties to arrive at an agreement. Now, 
what are the hallmarks of mediation? So when you think about mediation, what are its hallmarks, the key elements? One is confidentiality, okay? So mediation is confidential. Any discussions there, offers of settlement, anything that happens there is confidential, except it, to the extent, for example, that you know there might be a crime that happens. And in that case, the mediator can be a witness, but the mediator cannot testify as to anything that is said and done during the mediation process. He cannot be called as a witness. Any offers of settlement cannot be used by any of the parties uh, you know, as evidence. Any of the parties cannot record the, uh, the mediation proceeding, for example, for the purpose of using it as evidence because of the confidentiality of uh, the mediation process. It's voluntary in the sense that no one can be compelled to enter into uh, a mediation agreement or in, in, into a settlement. It is for the parties to really voluntarily decide to uh, enter into a settlement of a dispute. Uh, another hallmark is empowerment in the sense that the power actually lies with the parties, not with the mediator. Uh, in the context of a legal proceeding, the power is not with the parties, it is with a judge. So in mediation, the idea there is that the, the parties have the power to resolve the dispute by themselves instead of giving it to somebody else, instead of relinquishing that, that, you know, that opportunity or the power to resolve the dispute, the parties have the power to resolve the dispute. Uh, there's also the, the hallmark of neutrality, the, because the mediator is neutral, is impartial, is objective. He, the mediator does not take sides. Uh, this is important because when you speak, for example, when we examine conciliation, and we're gonna briefly touch that, the, the conciliator, in, uh, as a matter of distinction, actually provides advice as to the respective legal positions of the parties. The, the conciliator will probably say that, you know, after, based on the dispute, it is likely the case that this is the, the probable outcome. In that case, in a sense, there is, uh, there's, it's difficult to say that there is neutrality in relation to the legal position because the conciliator does arrive at a view as to what the likely legal outcomes might be. On the other hand, when you speak of mediation, the mediator is neutral in all respects, neutral in the process, neutral in the way that he or she facilitates the mediation, and neutral in terms of the outcome, because the mediator does not give any advice as to the legal position of the parties or as to the possible legal outcome of a dispute that comes to a court. Another hallmark uh, of mediation, of course, is the ability of the parties, not only to settle the dispute, but to actually uh, own the solution and create the solution for themselves. And they can be as inventive as they wish. They can explore all possible options as they wish, as opposed to having a judge adjudicate you know, uh, a, a legal issue or an outcome of a dispute. So we've gone through, and I think we've had sufficient time to kind of you know, really uh, examine what mediation is. In the next few slides, we're gonna briefly uh, try to distinguish mediation from conciliation and arbitration. Of course, we're gonna be discussing these two topics in detail later on, but at this stage, you may have in mind, you know, okay, so now I have, a, I have an, an idea about mediation. How different is it from conciliation and how different is it from arbitration? So we're gonna briefly touch upon uh, those two other ADR processes as well in this lecture video. So let's just go through the dispute resolution process. Of course, uh, the best way to resolve a dispute is not to have a dispute in the first place. Uh, Sun Xu said this, that uh, the best wars are the wars that are not fought, okay? Or yeah, or the best wars are those where you don't even have to fire a shot. So what is prevent the dispute? We've covered negotiation. And, but the processes that help you uh, would be mediation. You and the other people involved the dispute with help from a third party, try to reach an agreement. And then the other dispute resolution process is one that gives you advice. And that's, for example, conciliation or neutral evaluation or the use of the ombudsman. So here you will notice that the process of uh, conciliation involves a third party giving advice, okay? Now, 
moving from just helping the parties to discuss a dispute towards conciliation where the conciliator uh, actually gives advice, you can then go to a point where you have a third party making a decision such as uh, through arbitration. So the key point is that the arbitrator makes a decision, the conciliator gives advice, the mediator uh, facilitates, merely facilitates a discussion, facilitates the parties trying to reach an agreement. And of course, uh, in terms of making a dispute, courts and tribunals do that uh, as you know th their very uh, role in the uh, legal system. So what is conciliation? It is a process in which the particip participants with the assistance of the dispute resolution practitioner or the conciliator, they identify the issues in dispute, develop options, consider alternatives and endeavor to reach an agreement, which are exactly the same uh, things that a mediator ought to do. The key distinction, however, is that a conciliator will provide advice on the matters in dispute and or options for resolution, but will not make a determination. So in conciliation, the conciliator will provide advice on the matters in dispute and or options for resolution. In mediation, the mediator will never do that or should never do that, should never provide advice on the matters in dispute. The focus of the mediator is simply in getting the parties to discuss, to engage, and to talk towards a solution. But here in conciliation, the conciliation, the conciliator will actually provide advice on the matters in dispute. The, what it also means is that when you deal with the mediator, the mediator is often not an expert on the legal matter. So you might, in a family law matter, the the the, uh, the mediator may not know about family law. If it's a commercial dispute, the mediator may not be familiar with commercial law. Because the, again, the focus of the mediator is simply to you know, get the parties to talk. The strength of the mediator, mediator then is the ability of the mediator to try to get the parties to talk and you know, deal with the conflict in order to reach a solution. But the conciliator will actually provide advice and therefore it means that the, the conciliator has to be an expert on the matter in dispute. Okay, so that's again one of the key uh, in, uh, points that needs to be established. But the difference is that the, the point there with conciliation is that the conciliator cannot make a determination. It still it will still be up to the parties to arrive at a determination. So what conciliators will do? Um, the conciliator uh, will help everyone discuss the complaint and work towards resolving it, ask questions to gather more information, explain the law, point out the strengths and weaknesses of the complaint and response and provide information at the process, tell all parties about previous cases and what kind of outcomes are likely and make suggestions or give options for resolving the complaint. So you will notice that the conciliator has a more active role in trying to compel the parties to reach an agreement because here, the, the conciliator takes in that added role of really advising the parties about what the expected legal outcomes are and making suggestions in order to resolve a complaint. In mediation, the mediation is a bit more hands-off, really you know, just allowing the parties to think of, uh, of inventing options and looking at options to resolve a dispute. Now let's look at arbitration now. Uh, okay, so, Arbitration is a formal dispute resolution process, at least in Queensland, governed by the Commercial Arbitration Act. And remember, there is such a thing as a uniform commercial arbitration acts across all the states, uh, in which two or more parties refer their dispute to an independent third person, the arbitrator, for determination. So it's actually a third party arbitrator who makes a determination. It's actually possible that there might be several, uh, it might be a panel of arbitrators making a determination, depending on what the uh, arbitration agreement between the parties might be. Okay, now, arbitration, uh, as I mentioned, there is the Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act across the states. So uh, the states have, the states in Australia have decided to arrive or uh, legislate uh, a Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act so that they're, they're common across the states so that when there are commercial transactions or commercial agreements entered into by, uh, by parties, they know that anywhere they go, 
the way that their uh, commercial dispute might be treated uh, will, will be dealt with similarly and consistently under uniform commercial arbitration acts across the states. Now, the, the uniform commercial arbitration act across Australian states uh, are modeled after the United Nations Commission on Interna International Trade Law or the UN Citral. The United the UN Commission International Trade Law has been there for decades and helping uh, you know uh, nations, uh, helping states to uh, settle their uh, commercial their uh, their commercial conflicts. Uh, so, for example, you know the United States might have an issue in relation to supplying whatever wheat to Australia and they have a dispute, they can go to the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law for the purpose of arbitrating uh, the matter. And as I mentioned, in, in, in Queensland, we have the Commercial Arbitration Act 2011, which applies to domestic commercial disputes. Now, under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2011, Queensland under Section 1AC, the paramount object of the act is to facilitate the fair and final resolution of commercial disputes by impartial arbitral tribunals without unnecessary delay or expense. This act aims to achieve its paramount object by enabling the parties to agree about how their commercial disputes are to be resolved, uh, providing arbitration procedure, procedures that enable commercial disputes to be resolved in a cost-effective manner, informally and quickly. Now, of course, we get the sense that you know it's going to be arbitration and not before a judge. It's probably cheaper. It's probably faster. It's likely going to be faster. It's going to be quicker because you have an arbitrator, a panel of arbitrators who are focused on uh, making a determination in relation to a dispute. So that can be faster as opposed to having to go through the court system where there is a backlog and you know the case before the judge, uh, your case before the judge is just one of many thousands even of cases. In arbitration, you've got a dedicated uh, arbitrator or panel of arbitrators who are just probably going to be focusing on your disputes. It's going to be resolved. That will help uh, you know, resolve the dispute, which is important because if there is a commercial dispute, it can mean that you've got a major multi-million dollar project that is not moving or couldn't commence because of a dispute. But with the arbitrator, you know, that gets moved along because the arbitrator makes a determination. However, it doesn't have to be cost effective. It's not necessarily cheaper because it is expensive. You will still be using lawyers and you'll be paying for the arbitrator and the arbitrator can, you know, uh, can impose huge fees because these are experts. So arbitration is not necessarily cheaper than uh, the legal process. They may be cheaper in the sense that because you're able to quickly uh, have a determination made by an arbitrator, a panel of arbitrators, then it cuts down on costs of delays in projects and so on. Uh, now, so wh when does the uh, Commercial Arbitration Act 2011 apply, for example? So it, it begins with the idea that there has to be an arbitration agreement. An arbitration agreement is an agreement by the parties to submit to arbitration all or certain disputes which have arisen or which may arise between them in respect of a defined uh, legal relationship, whether contractual or not. So in other words, for there to be uh, arbitration between the parties, there must be an arbitration agreement, okay? And, but that agreement by the parties to submit to arbitration might be in relation to all the disputes under contract or to certain disputes. Uh, it, of course, it doesn't have to be contractual uh, in the sense that the parties haven't really entered into a contract. Uh, it could be a non-contractual relationship that the parties have, and yet they have agreed that uh, they've entered into an arbitration agreement. Uh, an arbitration agreement may, may be the form of an arbitration clause in a contract or in the form of a separate agreement, but the, uh, the arbitration agreement must be in writing. So in other words, if the uh, arbitration agreement does not meet the definition and the requirements under the Commercial Arbitration Act 2011, then the parties cannot avail of uh, the Commercial Arbitration Act 2011 for the purpose of uh, entering into arbitration. The advantage of the commercial Uniform Commercial Arbitration Act is that it provides procedures which are common across the jurisdictions in Australia as to the arbitration process. So everyone knows uh, how it will be like. Now, an arbitration agreement is in writing if its content is recorded in any form 
whether or not the arbitration agreement, the contract was concluded orally by conduct or by other means. Now take note, we're gonna be looking at arbitration as a separate topic later on. So on completing this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain the process of mediation and some key terms, the hallmarks of a mediation process, instances when it may not be appropriate to mediate, the role of mediation, and then distinguish mediation from conciliation and arbitration. And with that, I thank everyone for watching this uh, lecture video. And I'll see you again very soon. Thank you. Bye.